I guess at about maybe five in the afternoon, he had come in and he had tried to set the place on fire. He'd set the curtains on fire with both her and the uh, little boy in the apartment. Uh, when our deputies got there, he got away. Hi, I'm Gordon Carroll, author of the best-selling Gil Mason Sheepdogs mystery thriller series. And I want to thank you for joining me today as I relate some of my old police canine stories. And remember, like this video, comment, and subscribe. That's what keeps us going on here, so thanks so much. Tonight's story is called Trash Panda. And I was working with my third canine, who was Thor. You'll hear a bunch of his exploits as you go through these videos because he was uh, so good and so prolific. My dog Max was more prolific than him, but he worked way more years. He was fantastic too, so. Uh, but Thor was the perfect dog just because Max had a tendency to not always cap. It was hard to get him to let go of bad guys after he'd caught them. Whereas Thor, instantly when I would tell him to let go, he would let go. So he was my third dog. He was just a lot of fun and, and just such a sweetheart too. When he wasn't being fierce and ripping uh, bad guys up, he was a sweetheart around my kids and kindergartners and demos and everything else. In any case, we've been having a problem with a domestic violence suspect up in our precinct five. He had uh, broken up with this girl. They'd had a couple year relationship. I think they had a child together. But in any case, he became really violent. He was beating her up a lot. She finally kicked him out. So while I was off, he had come over there. He punched her around a little bit. When our deputies got there, he jumped off the balcony, got away. They never could find him. He came back later that night, assaulted her again. Our deputies came back again. He was gone. So they did an increased patrol, watching the area closely. Even with our increased patrol and three cars up there watching the place, he got inside, again assaulted her, and again got away just before they got inside. I don't know if he went out the balcony that time or if he took off the front, but she was on the third floor of this apartment, uh, in this apartment complex. So in any case, this went on for three days. He just kept coming back and he would come back multiple times during the day. As soon as the deputies were out of sight or he couldn't find them, boom, he would hit again. And he was just terrorizing this poor woman. And he would call her constantly. We tried pinging his phone, we tried all kinds of things. They just couldn't find him, couldn't catch him. So uh, on the fourth day, they called me in. So I came over with my canine. I guess at about maybe five in the afternoon, he had come in and he had tried to set the place on fire. He'd set the curtains on fire with both her and the uh, little boy in the apartment. Uh, when our deputies got there, he got away. They, I think one of our guys actually did get in a foot pursuit with him at that time. Saw him jump off the balcony, got in a foot pursuit, but lost him. They surrounded the area. They kept the perimeter there. They called me. I came in. I had my dog Thor with me. Took a couple of deputies. Actually, I took, uh, I think, about four SWAT guys with us because one of our guys that was chasing him said he thought he saw him that he had a gun. He did indeed have a gun on him too. Uh, went later on when we found him. But at that time, since we thought he had a gun, he'd already tried, I mean, this had been going on for three days and now the fourth day, and he had tried to set the place on fire with them in it. The escalation, I decided to have some SWAT guys with me. They're great for cover. They're better shots than I am by far. Plus I had to concentrate on the dog. When you're doing a canine search, you have to remember that the canine officer is totally clued into the canine. Because I had to look for subtle little things. We are a team. He does most of the work. I'm pretty much the chauffeur. I have to be able to see his signs, the way his body posture moves, what his head does. And in this case, you're gonna see that the head movements can be really, really important. Because what he's doing is this, he's tracking or he's uh, area scenting, which means he's just smelling for any fresh human scent. And whatever the wind is doing, whatever the temperature is doing, whatever the humidity is doing, other people in the area, different distractions like dogs or cats or trash or just anything in there can disrupt that, that work that the dog is doing because he's trying to focus in on just what he's supposed to find. But with those other things coming in, it can be very difficult. So the handler has to be watching that dog very, very closely or he will miss key clues that could either get you the bad guy or not get you the bad guy, which you'll see in this case. So we went ahead and we started on now. There was a big problem with this. SWAT had, I mean, uh, the area deputies had combed the entire complex for almost two hours before I got there because we didn't have a canine on at the time. So they are just searching on foot. 
That means we can't do a regular track. And the reason we can't do a regular track is all my dog's gonna do is track where all the cops have gone. Which in this case is perfectly understandable because we don't have a canine on, you work with what you have. And so they were just searching on foot just the way that they would have to. So we can't do a track, which is the surest and best way of catching a suspect when they flee from the scene. In this case, we can't do that. So we go to our next best, which is uh, an area search. And in an area search, what the dog is trained to look for is any fresh human scent. Now, if the bad guy's nice enough to leave us something of his that he just dropped, like his hat or gun or a nice sample of DNA evidence, then we could uh, have the dog smell that in a bag, and then he's gonna primarily look for just that suspect. However, you usually don't get that nice of a setting. What you usually get is the guy took off, he went that way, maybe, maybe you have that, or he just took off, we don't know where. So you're just gonna have to go search the whole area, which is why you have your perimeter, so that you can search that area, try to keep people out of it, and you just go find the bad guy. So that's what we did. I took my SWAT guys, I think I had about six of them with me. When we started off, it was dark by this time, it was probably 7, 7.30 at night, which is 19.30 hours for you uh, military types. So uh, we started searching, we were going through the whole complex a long ways. In my experience, usually if a police officer is doing a foot pursuit with a bad guy, one of two things happens. Either the guy is young and fit and fast, and he just books it and he's just, he never stops, he never looks back. Or it's a regular average everyday Joe, which means they're usually couch potatoes or something close to that. So they get away from the police officer. As soon as they get out of sight of them, bam, they hide. And they hide someplace there. So I usually concentrate on the closest area that I can first. So I start in a, in a circle and then I make it a spiral and I keep searching out like that. Unless I have a straight direction of travel, which in this case I did, because the, since the, the deputy had chased him and then lost him around the corner, I knew right where that deputy had stopped and I could start from there to start trying to do an area search. Now, I can't just do a track from there because the other deputies have come up to where he was. They didn't just stop there, they searched that whole area and they didn't find him several times. So uh, we, we couldn't do that, but we can do the area search. So I start the area search from where he was last seen, where I have somebody that is credible to me that he was last at. And so that's where we started. And we just started swarming on. So we searched a, a nice long portion. We weren't getting anything. And I thought, you know, and, but there were a lot of people out because it was only 7 o'clock or 7.30 in the uh, evening. And people were walking their dogs. They're out there. So we're getting all these distractions. The dog gets pulled off because another dog comes up or whatever. We have to tell those people to go back into their house. So even though we had gone down a long ways, I thought, you know, we're going to go back and we're going to check the area closest to it. Because in my experience, if it's an average Joe and he's not some hip hop athlete, then he's probably going to hide fairly close. There is always the danger that the suspect has a friend that lives in the area and he might go to that friend's house and stay there. In that case, it's even more difficult, but we had no evidence that that was the case. So I just wanted to search all the cars and the balconies and the cul-de-sac areas in there and just really check that. So we went back, started where we last seen him again, go down, we go past uh, an enclosure for dumpsters with a bunch of cars that are parked there. Uh, we go a little bit past it, then uh, Thor brings me back. We go on to the other side. And as we're going down there, I'm sniffing all the cars and underneath the cars as we're going by. As we get a little bit past, uh, maybe 15, 20 yards past the enclosure of the dumpster, I see Thor's head just kind of go like that. I can't tell you how many bad guys I've caught from that one little gesture. Because that one little gesture tells me he got a whiff of something that was different to him. The dogs, after they get more experience, when they're rookie dogs, it's one thing. They smell fresh human odor. But experienced canines, they begin to catch what we call enhanced odor. And enhanced odor is, it can be alcohol, it can be tobacco, it can be narcotics in their system can be adrenaline rushes. We don't really totally know. But from my experience, I think it's a mixture of a lot of those things. Because a lot of the guys that we go after, they're either on drugs or they're drunk, or I mean, or they're al they have al alcohol on board, or almost always they're sweating and they have adrenaline uh, dumps because they're afraid they're gonna get caught by the cops. 
and they're physically exerting themselves. So you usually have those things. So the experienced dogs really start to catch that. So even though there's other people out walking their dogs and doing stuff like that, and they check them to make sure that they're not the person they're looking for, when they suddenly get that little bit of whiff of odor that is enhanced, they give you that little head, head chuck. It might not be enough because of the wind and what it's doing, bouncing off of cars and going here and there. It may not be enough to just drag them over. Sometimes it is, in fact, often it is. Sometimes it's not, it's just, it's just like a little, just a little taste of it. And so they will give you that head chunk and then they continue on because they've got other smells over here that they're deciphering. You as the handler, if you see that and you're, you've been experienced for a while, you know to take your dog back into that area and check it. So I brought him back around. Uh, we went up by the dumpster again as we got past the dumpster. Now the wind was coming out of the northwest and uh, blowing towards the southeast. So in canine, the wind direction and the humidity and things like that are paramount to us. Because if you don't have your dog in the right area for the wind, then he's not going to catch their scent. So as I got past the enclosure, remember that when he first picked it up, he was south and east of it. So this time, he was south of it and east, but he was further down. And the reason was I had to get far enough down to where that scent could still linger over. And he gave me just a little head check again. So I went back up by the enclosure and I said, hey, SWAT guys, check this dumpster enclosure really carefully. So the SWAT guys swarmed into there. They searched it all, came back, said, nope, no bad guy. They looked in the actual trash cans. They got in there, dug around a little bit, nothing. I said, I said, okay, so we started going again. And as I cut across, here's the enclosure here. As I cut across this way, give me that little head check again. I was like, oh, no, no, we're gonna go check it again. Now you could have just been smelling the SWAT, the SWAT guys, they cause a lot of ground disturbance in the trash cans. I just call it ground disturbance, it's really trash disturbance. But he goes up and as he goes in there, door just goes all the way up to the second to the last uh, trash dumpster in there and boom, goes underneath it, grabs the guy by the shoulder and just drags him right over. The guy's screaming, ah! He'd been in there for hours. I mean, under there for hours. He wasn't in the, the dumpster, he was underneath it. And it's like this much clearance. So how he got in there, I don't know, but he did. Thor just drags him right out. We get him over here, get him cuffed up and everything else. He's exhausted and, uh, and we take him into custody. Uh, so that was Thor's little trash panda experience. Uh, the guy thought he could be a trash panda. Didn't work. Thor smelled enough. So uh, a fun time and also that guy was caught, girl and her son were safe and he spent a lot of time in prison. So thanks so much for joining me. If you enjoyed this along with uh, our other canine tales, please watch those. I am the best-selling author of the uh, Sheepdog series uh, with Gil Mason and uh, please read my books if you like these kind of stories because I think you'll like the books too. They're a lot of fun and a lot of excitement. You won't be sorry. Thanks again.